Hey there, girls and guys, it's Vetamore here, and the new patch notes have literally just come out. They've just been released publicly, and we're basically just going to go over everything that you need to know, because there's a lot of fucking information in there. It's complicated. It blows my mind personally. So I've got specialists to come on and talk about it. I've got It's Martini, one of the best players in the game. How's it going, Martini? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. I've also got Zeptile, another amazing player and another coach of Illuvium. How's it going, Zep? Hey, thanks for having me. I think I start to get known in this channel. <laughs> <laughs> and for comic relief and appreciation of his beard, we bring on Jim Barino. <laughs> I guess, Look up um, to the beard. <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate bringing me on. So the first thing that I want to ask you guys is, like, w after having read it, like, just what what is your takeaway if you had to have a takeaway? Just that somebody that's, like, just already got Private Beta 1 access, they've played it a bit, but maybe they just play, like, one or two waves per day, maybe, like, a few days a week. Like, what he's changed for these people and what do these patch notes mean for them i think the biggest takeaway for me is that it's super accessible to everyone uh you can jump in you can see an affinity or a class that looks fun to you and say i'm gonna play fire today or i'm gonna stack a bunch of bulwarks today and you can do it because with all of the new alluvials all of the new bonding changes there's really such a huge variety of playstyles that you can do almost anything you want and a lot of different playstyles are going to be successful as opposed to BB1 where playing quote well, there was a pretty much forced play style that you had to follow and it's harder for new people to just jump in and, and know what to do. Zep? I agree with everything he said. I think uh, this version of the game is actually way better for a casual audience. Uh, it makes the game easier, more enjoyable for them, but I actually, I, even for, the, for us actually. And yeah, like just, before, if you had to to go for five uh, five hours or six hours, whatever, you were kind of feeling like you were trolling. It's not the case anymore. You are actually rewarded for it. Uh, I get totally what uh, Martini said. Jim, your 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 takeaway. I think we're pretty much all in agreement here. Like the fact that there's so many different things added. And it looks like they did an okay job at bouncing. We won't know until we get PV2 exactly. But I think there was a defined way you had to play PV1 most of the time. And the new changes with augments, especially in bonding, and then the addition of the tier zeros, is going to make it where there's so many different things you can do to play the game and actually not be trolling that it's just going to make it way more fun, way more replayable in general. Mm -hmm. So so all in all, the game will be like instead of having to play literally like like granite um every time and, and that's playing specific alluvials, playing the meta, like in a very specific way that pretty much everyone was playing a very similar way. There was a few variations, but overall everyone was playing a similar way. There'll not only be like extra alluvials, so there'll be more variation in that, but like it'll be a bit more balanced out like regarding like just granite or like all the all the affinities and everything so that mm -hmm. it's just more flexible for newcomers i think you guys were saying earlier when you were just by the way we, we've started filming all of this because they've just we've all been having this chat and uh, like analyzing all this data for like two hours or something um and we were like why don't we make a video to sort of you know give you guys a bit of a, a bit of insight into into what does all of this mean um so you you guys were sort of saying that you people are actually going to be much more likely with less experience to maybe get to further waves. Yes, uh, the tools that are given to us in this uh, this private beta two are very very powerful, uh, which means that even though it maybe seems a lot of information to get for for many people, uh, it is actually still somewhat intuitive and maybe even more intuitive than it was in PV1. That's what uh, Martini was trying to say earlier. Like, you can just go with barely no idea, focus on something, and it will get some results. Also, the, you mentioned grinding before. That's also something that has been solved, kind of, with the addition of checkpoints, which is 
something that a lot of people were waiting. And I think that what made a lot of people not play that much the PB1 was the fact that every time they were losing or crashing, they had to replay for 30 to 40 minutes uh, before they get to the sp to that specific wave, which is not the case anymore, and that's very very enjoyable. Totally, Martini. Yeah, I would say the same thing. the The checkpoints are going to be huge for pretty much every single player's enjoyment. No one wants to start over from one and spend 20, 30, 40 minutes getting back to where they were. So, mm -hmm. being able to go back five levels or even two or three levels, depending on when you lose, is such a huge quality of life improvement that I think it's going to help with player retention a lot. People are going to be able to play less in a given day, get more enjoyment out of it, and therefore be encouraged to keep playing for a longer period over a month, two months, whatever it may be, as opposed to a lot of people getting potentially bored or frustrated after maybe just a couple weeks of playing. So I think the checkpoints are huge. Yeah, in the in the micro vert like side of it, like each wave actually feels a lot more fast paced now because I think a lot of the VFX and a lot of even the actual omegas and the animations and the like cast times, they've been reduced in time a lot more so that things appear more fast paced, they look more engaging, and then like as you also get to learn a lot more because instead of like struggling with the early game and maybe get to the mid game sometimes and then once in a blue moon get to the late game you actually get to you know practice the early game then practice the mid game if you lose in the mid game you continue with checkpoints and you get a lot more practice in mid and late game than you would in pb1 where like some people would barely ever get late game practice um and i think that's that's gonna make it a lot more replayable 100 percent 100 percent jimbo <laughs> yeah i think um I, I don't know if we've touched on this yet but i think uh as you said the early game it's probably gonna be a lot easier i think the late game i don't know how you guys feel about it but i feel like the late game was sometimes easier than the mid game and i think that might change with the addition of augments mm -hmm. i agree i agree yeah, like a lot of people never got to experience the late game and therefore thought, oh, some big number like 26, it must be insanely hard. I keep dying on 15, 14, 13. But realistically, those mid-teen waves or upper teens are probably some of the hardest waves in PB1. Mm -hmm. um, and now with the amount of scaling, maybe those late waves are actually the harder ones. And I think that'll be a more pleasant experience for a lot of players. Yeah, the difficulty actually scaling um, as, as you go up the waves which which is just way better because like i've now been to wave 30 twice and both of those times it was a real grind getting past like wave 15 to 23 that sort of area and then once you got past it i i'm pretty sure i didn't even die once i just went all the way to 30 because you've pretty much got all your units together and everything and all the way home let's go but then now you get all your units like you can actually go beyond wave 30 and they've you've got augments they've got it's it's a lot more scalable let's let's jump into the powerpoint then okay so now we're going to be going a little bit deeper into some of the minutiae of all of these patch notes if you haven't actually read the patch notes you can find them in the description of this video if you can't be bothered to because it's long then keep watching Either way, just keep watching, though. <laughs> Martini, take it away. <laughs> yeah, sure. So this is just a general overview of the patch notes. Um, we've got a bunch of new units. We're going to have augments, which are equipable items, effectively, that can uh, buff your alluvials. Uh, the way you gain gold every round or mastery points uh, is going to scale based on how many unspent points you have. So there's going to be some strategy around that. And uh, just general balance changes and changes to synergies. Uh, there's lots to go over. So we'll be getting into that in the later slides. Okay, first one, bonding. Bonding is a new mechanic that they added with this private beta 2 that is, I feel, very, very interesting and opens a lot of new doors, actually. Um, not only it allows you to explore some synergies that you were not able uh, before, but it also allows you to play your ranger in a specific and unique way every time you play, which was not the case before. Before we had five different weapons and most people were using only two or one. Now you will be able to have um, plenty of ways to play your ranger. It can be a fire bulwark to... Uh, 
a Colossus uh, Air, or even a Water Psyon. That's very, very good. I think that's going to allow us to empower a lot of other Illuvials as well, because as I said, you enable some synergies that were not available before. What to say about bonding right now and how does it work? You select one unit that you ha need to have on your board and your ranger will add the synergies from that Illuvial on top of their of its own synergy. So if your ranger was, for example, a bulwark air and you make it like, let's say, with a Tatopi, which is Psyon Earth, then you would have your ranger being Dust Harbinger, which is very fun. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff we will be able to, to make with our ranger, which I think is very a, a very unique mechanic, actually, even in video games in general. So I'm really, really interested on, on seeing how it's going to be going forward. Another thing to know about it is that it, as it is right now, it doesn't cost any mastery points, so you can do it whenever you want. The only condition is that if you want, if you are bonded to one Illuvial and you want to change to another Illuvial, you have to sell the one you were previously bonded, bonded to. I was going to ask about the cost, but obviously there's no cost. But also, so basically you get a weapon on the, on the, the Ranger and that has, you know, an affinity and a, and a class. Um, but then you also bond it and then it gets both of those affinities and so it can like have double earth making it essentially granite um like but can you only bond it with stage one alluvials no uh if you bond it to a, a stage two or higher what will happen is that there's a, something about a dominant synergy on the alluvials that's something that we don't have many informations like we don't we cannot say Oh, Arkelion is going to give you Empath or Bulwark. Uh, I'm a bit sad that that's not, that doesn't make part of the patch notes. But I guess it will be a we'll fun part out. as well to just try and figure out. So we'll, yeah, we'll find out. Actually, to uh, the bonding topic that's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's going to be useful, but the Stage 2 Lynxes only have a class and no affinity. So if you bond to a Stage 2 Lynx, you can have a composite class and a primary affinity on your Ranger. As far as I know, there's no other way to have one primary and one composite. You're either going to have both composites or both primaries. So that could create some interesting scenarios. I don't know if it's going to be useful, but just thought I'd point it out. I mean, that's, it's, it sounds like a nerf. <laughs> no, but that, that's actually a very good point. Like, maybe actually sometimes you might want to have air instead of having frost, for example. Yeah, no, totally, totally. Um, I can briefly talk about this slide. Uh, this is just going to be the general game flow of survival mode. So how the rounds work, how checkpoints work, um, this new interest system. Um, and one interesting thing is with the leaderboard, there's no... The casual training mode will not be on the leaderboard anymore with infinite time, so it makes it slightly more competitive. And according to this document, we'll have 40 seconds on round one, and each round we beat will gain an extra five seconds of timer. So by round 20, you'll have a couple of minutes. By round 30, you'll have three minutes. So compared to the 60-second timer we have in PB1, it actually scales pretty high. But there's also more things to think about with augments and, and bonding and whatnot. So I think this is a, a really nice change and they're open to feedback on the time if we think it's too much or too little. They're just numbers that can be changed. Awesome. So then you get the pterodactyl line. Uh, for those who don't know it, it's basically the Ramphi, Ramphi, Ramphire, uh, which is our own Charizard. It has changed quite a lot. We will get back overall to what uh, was made, really. Basically, they changed essentially its role. Before, Ra Ramfire was uh, supposed to be a unit that was doing not only a big Omega, but was also scaling and big, becoming stronger over the fight thanks to more attack speed and the, basically the Slayer synergy. Right now, they changed it to make it more reliable around his Omega ability, and therefore they gave him the Psyon trait instead of the Fighter, making it a, a Phantom. So how does it change the behavior of the Illuvial, now it will not kill you by just attacking. In fact, when we will give a look at the numbers, those numbers of just the auto attacks were actually almost get to the ground. But now because of Psyon, his Omega ability might hurt. As we see, like we can see, say that the attack damage was almost halved, less HP because I personally do agree with this change. But then we see also that the multiplier on the energy damage was reduced because now it scales with Psyon. 
Sion, which was not the case uh, before. So overall, I think that Runfire is not as good as it was before, but it will be a fun and interesting uh, unit to use because it has a role and it sticks to it. Its role is to make a big Omega ability that does a lot of damage, and that's what is supposed to make it scary. At least they did well on that job. So it literally is just all about the Omega now. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it just, its attack damage just isn't that much. I think I think earlier you guys were comparing it to an Archie, was it, or an Alfie? No, we were comparing Ram Fight, like the stage two. Okay. With a lot of stuff, and actually a lot of stuff, like for example, Axdon do does more damage than Ram Fight, or uh, I saw like. Was it Atipo? Atipo does as much as, as much damage as Ramphite. Yeah. That's yeah, they really turned the pterodactyls that, 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 into that's... pure casters. They yeah. do yeah. not attack for effectively any damage. Mm -hmm. um, one important point too here uh, from this sheet you can see, and if anyone has seen any uh, snippets of PD2, uh, big change with the pterodactyls is they have starting energy now. So they start with a little over half of their energy pool. So they're going to cost pretty cast, quick. Right. Yeah. That first cast that comes out comes out much sooner sooner than before, which kind of fits with the idea of they're, they're like pure casters. The only problem is that, that first cast doesn't do enough. They're just sitting there forever before they cast again. Their auto attacks aren't really doing anything. So yeah. it's going to be interesting to see if this unit's actually any good. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be kind interesting of reliable to see. On Sorry, Jim. No, you're good. I was just going to say it's going to be interesting to see if, uh, since he does start with like being way closer to his Omega, it's going to be interesting to see if he's just dying before the second one goes off, or if he can actually get multiple Omegas off. Because if he can, then he might be even stronger than before. But definitely still to be determined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. I would want clear clear evidence on that one like only one example will not be enough <laughs> for sure okay so yeah i can talk about the anteater line a bit this one's been changed dramatically i think this line uh especially the stage three has been a huge pain point for many many people playing pb1 including myself i swear this unit cheats when i play against it it's completely <laughs> unfair i'm so happy that it's getting changed but uh yeah let's look at what's actually changing so they admit in this line that the numbers were grossly inflated. The unit could sometimes use its ability and hit you for over 2,000 damage. And if you had multiple units near each other, it could hit two or three units at a time. Um, this empath rogue with a de with defensive affinities, you would assume is supposed to be kind of a utility healer type unit, but it, it ended up being a, the deadliest assassin in the game. So with this rework now, its ability no longer crits, it no longer silences and blinds, and it no longer provides Vermilion with a shield. Instead, it hits in a large AoE, gives the Vermilion dodge chance, and debuffs the units that it hits, reducing their Omega power. And it does a little bit of damage too, although the damage is significantly less than what old Vermilion did. So it's much more of a supporty debuff kind of unit, utility unit. Um, at this point, without trying it myself, hard to say if this is good or not. It's probably situational, but personally, I prefer this by a long shot over what Vermilion was doing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have to add there that it. Uh, I think it also synergizes very well with the wall spore synergy. You know, that is already a very debuff-oriented uh, synergy that makes that when you die, you debuff the opponent. So I kind of like the the direction the game is is going towards giving some sort of an identity to every single Illuvial and kind of stick to it. No craziness like a supportive unit that becomes suddenly the deadliest uh, assassin in the game. Just it makes all more sense like it's more intuitive actually even for us i'm thinking uh people might be underestimating it a little bit especially if you have a bunch of carries stacked up on the enemy team in the same area i feel like it could be pretty good then but again it's uh definitely not going to be as good as it was so yes, one I more comment i want to make on the anteater line um we do have augments there's a lot of different things they can provide. With the increased dodge chance on this and how that synergizes with Spore and life gain and the fact that it debuffs everything, some kind of taunt on this unit, getting a lot of things to attack it, where it's probably quite tanky, and then debuffing them, it could it could potentially be a really good support unit with that sort of item on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, especially because when you say with the taunt, which would be super interesting, is that you would get maybe get some to surround it and basically making your Omega ability more valuable. So yeah, th there are interesting things about this Vermilion, I think. Uh, it will be fun to figure out whether or not it's good, but in a general way, I just like the direction it's taking. And the pistol shrimp line, Papau, 
Okay, so now we have Pistol Shrimp Line, which got massive buffs, um, but also kind of changed on, on its role. Like before, its auto attacks were very deadly, and now they are less deadly for the stage 3, but actually way, way better for the stage 1s and 2s, and uh, just making it more consistent ac across the, the three stages. And its Omega became actually a hard hitting single target Omega ability instead of just a big laser crossing the wall, the wall map. So that's what's uh, gonna happen. Like you, you can see here the real numbers, but in a general way, I think that an invoker should be played more for its Omega than for its auto attack. So once again, I'm very, very happy with the direction it's taking. We don't have the, the stats, the, the charts here on the screen, but mm -hmm. uh, Zeph kind of alluded to it. Uh, the auto attack damage has been reduced for dual up, so he doesn't slap as hard. And for Alfie, it was actually increased by quite a lot. So Alfie, much better than before. Yeah, I, I remember before you hard. guys were saying like Alfie's just a useless unit. It's not worth the more three points that it costs. Oh, it was but, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, trash. But Alfie actually like auto attacks pretty hard now and has this updated uh, Omega that goes single target instead of piercing through things. So Alfie That's should a be a, speed. a serious unit. Yeah. And they also reworked the way Omegas work now. Remember how if um it kills one of the units that it's attacking, it still goes to the next one behind it. So yeah. I think that's going to be a pretty big buff in general. That actually is true for a lot of units. Like um, that's a, a change we can discuss it right now. Thanks for bringing the topic, Jim. Is that before there was that bug that let's say your run fire goes up on the sky and its actual target die, uh, would die, you would lose your entire cast. Now within the bu bug fixes, the, your Omega will end up no matter what, unless you get stunned out of it or you die. Which means interrupted by the player's fault or the Illuvial's fault and not because of a bug, basically. Which is great. Like, your Seaforus will cast. <laughs> I still want evidence on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, uh, I'll talk about the hyper changes. Um, I think these are pretty notable and I think they're going in a really good direction. So from PV1, anyone that's experienced hyper has probably noticed that Bulwark feels really, really strong and you probably didn't even know what the Scion hyper did. So what we can see from these hyper changes is that Bulwark no longer gives insane regen and the uh, hardened state that we had with Bulwark which mitigated 100% of crit damage, uh, now only mitigates 15-50%. Um, so still a nice hyper, but not as crazy strong. And on the rogue side, which was very likely the second best hyper, we no longer get the silence that the rogues provide, which was very, very powerful. So these two have been toned down a bit. Uh, fighter is roughly the same as it was before. I don't remember the exact numbers, but that was kind of it the was, middle of the road. Just those numbers. Decent it's one anyway. Changed. And then um, Scion now gets 50% Omega power, which is actually pretty big. I think it was only 30% in the previous uh, version. So this is a lot of damage for Scions, which is really nice. And Empaths, the healing that it provided was quite minimal, and now it's a slightly bigger number that uh, looks a little more impactful to me. So I think these hyper changes are perfect. You have the, the two at the bottom end toned up a little bit, the two at the top end toned down a little bit. Another cool thing to mention is that obviously like, Sometimes in PV1, it felt kind of slow. Like if if a wa if an entire wave ends up going like a minute or even into like it timing out, like it's just so long to watch and the battle can feel kind of slow. Not only are the like animations now a lot quicker and the attacks a lot quicker, but 40 seconds in out of the like 60 seconds that a wave lasts, 40 seconds in, basically everything just goes kind of crazy and gets turned up a notch and sped up in a way for the next 20 seconds. Um, do, you, do you guys want to explain a bit deeper into exactly how it gets turned up? Because it doesn't just literally get turned up. It, it's a very specific um, kind of amplification. Yeah, so basically uh, every second after this 40 second time, the board will pulse and it flashes very brightly. You'll know what's happening. And every single unit on the board will just lose a percentage of their HP. Um, and that percentage increases every tick. So given a certain like 10 seconds or so, maybe 15 at the max, this is going to kill every unit on the board. So this, this will end the game. And uh, the, the units that are left with the most HP uh, are going to win. So if everyone on the board dies from the same tick, whoever had, whoever was the furthest away from dying is going to actually be the victor. Uh, but in most cases, there'll be one or two units left that 
happened to have more HP and didn't quite tick down along with the other units. Mm -hmm. But it's just a way to prevent tie to prevent ties and get get the game to end quickly. Get the What's the going. overall feeling about this? Positive, negative? Um, it's hard to say right now, but I think it's going to favor certain units or comps more than other ones. And um, we may have to do some experimenting to figure out what those comps or units are. I'm a little concerned, but uh, we'll see. We might also have to deal with the problem of the timing, like what is supposed to happen at the, those 40 se uh, seconds? Was an Adorius just about to cast or was a Runfire just about to cast? Like, because it might just change a winning game that would be clearly and clean in PB1, a clear win, into a loss because of that mechanic. That might change kind of the way we evaluate a board. Uh, and as Martini said, I think that this would benefit some extreme play, by, uh, play styles. I think that heavy offense and heavy defense both take advantage of, of this, but the balanced middle ground might be hurt by the by, by the system. But yeah, we didn't test it yet, so let's not be too hard towards it. Uh, I I think in a general way, it's nice that they are trying to prevent the awkwardness of having a Malura tanking for the last 20 seconds alone against a full board. So, yeah. I, also, Malura's animation has been made way quicker, which is great. But um, you make a very good point that I just I hadn't thought about Zep, which is that like maybe we start like having to figure out like what is this? What does this alluvial do at the forty second mark? What does this like? What is the timing that it produces at forty seconds? And how like maybe even factoring that into like higher level strategy potentially? Because if we get to forty seconds that might change the game compared to how it might have played out had had they had these pulses not played out exactly the the way that then they now will be right overall like let's see how it goes when when it when it happens though right mm, definitely also introducing four conditions okay so poison now will be uh something that will help against especially high hp units uh we see that it does percent damage uh, over time as pure damage uh, percent HP as pure damage meaning that there is no way to mitigate that, that, that damage um, for Frost is an awkward one, I actually almost feel like it's useless because the time you stack it up to 9 times to make it relevant plus the time you need to make more auto attacks because just dealing one auto attack doesn't make something worth it, you have actually to make multiple auto attacks to make almost a benefit. I think this takes way too long to get a benefit from to, to be uh, interesting. By the way, how does somebody actually get one of these conditions up? Uh, yes, so these conditions are, uh, are conditions that can be uh, inflicted either by an Omega or an Augment most of the time, oh, but also right, some right. synergies could as well. So some synergies, like that would just be part of what they do, but then within just like the Augments, you can maybe add poison, frost, or burn, or wound to the abilities of an alluvial as an extra bonus. From his omega abilities, or even from his auto attacks. Some. Yeah, 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 as well. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so we already mentioned poison as a damage. Burn and wound are also damage damaging conditions. Uh, they just scale in a slightly different way. So burn is uh, deals damage based on percent of missing health. So the more a unit is already damaged, the stronger the burn is going to be. So um, for wound, a lot of games call this bleed. Um, it's just a new terminology. And um, so this is going to be physical damage over time based on the physical damage dealt. So a hard hitting physical hit will wound an enemy for a lot more damage than a 90% energy damage attack or something, just as an example. Um, but wound, burn, and poison are all going to be damage over time effects that scale slightly differently. Also included in the patch notes were all the new alluvials that are going to be added. Now, we haven't really covered these at all, and honestly, they deserve a video in and of themselves. I kind of want to cover that video once the private beta comes out, because then we also will have footage of all of these different alluvials, and we'll have also been able to see them in action. So I'll cover those a lot more deeply once the private beta comes out. Um, but in the meantime, we're just going to cover our overall, like just vibe and feelings about everything that we've covered in this video. All in all, Zep, like, what is your favorite thing about these patch notes and what is the thing that you're most sort of not sure about 
um, e e e out of these patch notes? Um, yeah, in a general way, I'm very, very happy about the patch notes and the direction it's taking. Um, the thing I like the most probably is Ant Eater, the way they reworked it in a way that makes actually sense with its synergies. The thing I hate the most is about the Dodo line, which is very confusing. Um, it got nerfed to the ground while the patch note says it's perfect. So question mark here. Did it get nerfed? Very, very hard. Really? Yes. Oh, but the patch notes actually did say that it was perfect as it was, mm -hmm. but they still nerfed it. To the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess Ben's going to have to answer for that. <laughs> I, I think maybe Ben was trying to make a joke with the patch note about saying, oh, it's actually perfect. We're not, we're not touching it. But it was confusing after reading the patch note and say, nothing has changed. And then you go to the numbers and say, and see, wait, what did you do to my caca? My couscous? <laughs> Come on. Jumbo, what is your favorite thing about the patch notes? And what is the thing that you're most worried about? I'm worried about uh, Augmus being a little too strong, but I guess we'll, uh, again, it's hard to tell what anything is imbalanced without actually playing the game. So it, it doesn't really hold much weight, but I'm feeling like Augments might be a little too strong, but they're going to be so much fun to play around with regardless. And what are you most looking forward to or excited about and, and pleased with? Yeah, dude, I'm so, so pumped that we finally have like multiple ways to play the game. Like there's so many different ways that you can play and actually not be trolling. It's going to be viable to do 10 different builds, 100%. I'm so stoked on that. Awesome. Awesome. I'm just stoked overall for just the quality of life improvements and the replayability that's coming in PB2. The fact that you can actually play for two hours straight without feeling like it's a chore. Whereas like in PB1 at the moment, honestly, the first run that I do in a day is a genuine joy. And then the, from the second time onwards, it starts to feel like this is, I'm actually just grinding for no reason here. And I'm not, why am I still doing this? I'm, it's not even a new puzzle anymore. I'm just trying to remember what I did last time and maybe try and tweak it a little like that's, and that's not the way that you learn. The way that you learn is you have to fix a puzzle and actually solve a puzzle and, and and overcome a new challenge. And that's what you'll be doing every single run, I feel like, much more in, in Private Beta 2, which I'm just, I can't wait for that. I can't wait for that. Well, thank you both for coming on. Martini had to go. Um, if anybody does want to find you guys, your all three of your Twitters will be in the description of this video also. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And peace. We'll see you in the next one. <laughs> peace. <laughs>